Welcome to QUT News. Hello. First tonight, there's increasing concern that Mount Argung volcano in Bali is about to erupt. There have been mass evacuations in the area, although tourist flights have not yet been cancelled. But many visitors travelling for the holidays could find themselves stuck for weeks by ash clouds. More than 75,000 people have been moved from the surrounding areas of Mount Agun as the volcano increasingly threatens to explode. Many are now huddled in makeshift centres kilometres from their homes and Indonesian President Joko Widodo has visited to reassure them. The central, provincial and district government will continue to try to minimise the economic losses of the community. Volcanologists say it's too difficult to predict when the volcano will erupt. The seismic activity of Mount Agung is still high and its status remains at the highest dangerous level. The experts say recordings of tremors deep within the volcano are still constant, but there are now more than 1,000 of them each day. Airlines are offering refunds to travellers who wish to stay home, but tourists in the popular beachside area of Kuta are taking it in their stride. Nobody's scared, so we're not scared. They're confident they won't feel the eruption itself. We think we'll be fine. 70, 70 kilometres away, we should be fine. But the resulting ash and gas cloud could well disrupt flight plans for weeks. Mount Agun last erupted 54 years ago and more than 1,000 people were killed. The Australian government is warning Aussie travellers to listen to authorities and follow instructions when the volcano erupts. Jessica Riga, QUT News. And in Vanuatu, more than 6,000 people have been moved to emergency shelters as a volcano called Monaro threatens to erupt too. It stirred earlier this month and continues to intensify. The volcano is now emitting ash and volcanic gas. Authorities have set up 15 emergency sites, but the large-scale evacuation is already straining supplies. The federal government and Australia's major gas producers are thrashing out a plan to prevent a shortage next year. The companies say they can produce more gas, but only if Australians pay a fair price because they get a better deal overseas. The Prime Minister has been warned of a gas shortage three times larger than previously forecast. So he called a meeting with Santos, Shell and Origin Energy to discuss it. The companies have been sending gas overseas for better prices and Malcolm Turnbull has threatened to limit those exports. Critics say that's not the answer. Having Malcolm Turnbull come in and wave his finger at the gas chiefs as he did before with the uh, energy heads, that's not an energy plan. The Prime Minister believes state governments are failing to develop their gas resources properly and that's adding to the shortfall and rising electricity prices. He's already met with electricity chiefs. The gas industry says it can supply enough locally but consumers must be willing to pay a fair price. The gas companies are committed to supplying the domestic market. They will do that, providing there is a clear line as to how the gas is to be supplied and when it's going to be taken. The onus will be on them ultimately to demonstrate to us that they can do it. If Mr Turnbull decides to pull the trigger on gas export restrictions, these would not come into effect until January 2018. Emma Crichton, QUT News. The first major test of driverless cars in Queensland will be held in Ipswich. The state government has announced details of the trial, which will be held in 2019. A road user's dream. Fewer crashes, reduced traffic and less stress. It'll soon be the new reality, with the Queensland government preparing for a trial of driverless cars. 500 Ipswich residents will be recruited to participate in two years. It will be the largest on-road trial in Australia, with the use of autopilot-style cars expected to reduce the road toll. And I've got no doubt that as we see technology take over more and more into the road space, we'll see safety improve as well. The minister told a major transport summit in Brisbane that the era of driverless cars is rapidly approaching. Technology is changing uh, how we move about uh, significantly. As the government prepares for the trial, the question remains whether the next generation of drivers will need any form of licence in the future. There's kids being born today who probably will never get a licence, they'll never need a licence. So in some ways I think there's going to be a big shake up in that world. 
The trial is also expected to reduce road congestion, but industry experts say there is still a long way to go. My view is we'll see less vehicles, but it will take about a decade or two to get there. A driverless future accelerating. Elizabeth Peel, QUT News. People with acquired brain injury will now get more assistance in Brisbane. A new rehabilitation program will help them recover at home. For Shane Daly and Miguel Kaori, being able to leave hospital sooner has been a welcome relief. Both men sustained brain injuries in separate accidents late last year. Miguel from falling asleep at the wheel and Shane... My accident was an uh, electric powered skateboard. I came off at approximately 42 kilometres an hour. The pair are taking part in a new trial program designed to rehabilitate patients in their own homes. The program also provides therapy apartments for regional and rural patients. It's skilling people and their families with the practical skills they need, but also those coping skills for when life doesn't go straight forward after this initial 12-week period, so period. For both men, even the simplest tasks prove difficult when returning home. It was very helpful because it helped me get back to do things I used to, so a lot of public transport. It's not until they help you with certain kind of issues that you've picked up on and you can help, they can help you with that and you can work on that and then really start feeling that confidence in yourself. For patients like Shane and Miguel, the rehabilitation apartment has not only allowed them the freedom to return home, it has given them the opportunity to start planning for the future. Something that not long ago seemed a long way off. Rachel Maguire, QUT News. Brisbane police are investigating a suspicious fire at prestigious Villanova Boys School. The blaze destroyed a shed with tractors and lawnmowers. Another massive fire tore through a shop building in Adelaide South. It too is thought to have been deliberately lit. Police and fire crews were called to a group of businesses in Parkside to find a travel agency in flames. Two neighbouring businesses were damaged, with the damage bill over half a million dollars. The Brisbane City Council is recycling old roads. It says the Sustainable Streets program is saving ratepayers as well as the environment. This is where the Brisbane City Council does much of the groundwork for its road recycling program. The Carina plant plays a key role in processing materials from old roads, curbing and footpaths. More than 63,000 tonnes of asphalt from the council's road networks was recycled in the last year alone. We scrape off the top level, we bring it here, we crush it down and we put it back into the system. These recycled elements produce 20% of the materials used in new roads. But we're doing work right now to increase that to 30% and, make, and our target is to be sure to reach 40% in the future. The Council's $360 million Smoother Suburban Streets program will see 2,000 roads resurfaced over four years. 500 streets have already been improved with another 20 major roads set to be resurfaced before the end of the year, laying the base for a greener future. Tiffany Turnbull, QUT News. A man has been charged over a fatal hit and run incident in which he allegedly returned to the scene before driving away again. A 19 year old girl was struck in the western Sydney suburb of Milpera as she returned home from a night out. Paramedics rushed to the accident but could not save the young woman. Police appealed for help to locate a white ute with a refrigeration unit and a smashed mirror. They allege the man they've charged was driving on a suspended licence. Looking again at our main story, more evacuations as two volcanoes threaten to erupt in our region. And still to come, the frightening words of war from the US and North Korea. US President Donald Trump says he's prepared to strike North Korea should they take action against US forces. It comes as a North Korean government accused Mr. Trump of declaring war on the reclusive regime. President Trump says North Korea would suffer dire consequences if it followed through with threats to US aircraft flying too close to its borders. If we take that option, it will be devastating. I can tell you that devastating for North Korea. 
That's called the military option. If we have to take it, we will. Mr. Trump was meeting with Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy to discuss Catalan independence and the North Korean threats. Prime Minister Rajoy says while no one wants a war on the Korean peninsula, it's important to be forceful in defending the values of democracy. For a fifth day, the president continued to criticize NFL players taking a knee during the national anthem. To me, that was a very important moment. I don't think you can disrespect our country, our flag, our national anthem. Uh, to me, the NFL situation is a very important situation. It's been a busy week for Mr. Trump. His third attempt at an Obamacare repeal has stalled, and six senior White House staff have been named in an email scandal. Today, he heads to hurricane-ravaged Puerto Rico, where more than three million Americans are still without power. Joanna Little, QUT News. Mexican rescue workers will stop looking for earthquake survivors in 24 hours, with the death toll at 333 people. Many families are now angry they haven't been able to search for relatives themselves. The 7.1 magnitude earthquake that ripped through Mexico last week has destroyed homes and killed hundreds. Now, Mexico is looking forward, declaring rescue operations at four sites will cease tomorrow. Los caninos no han en tocado señal. Rescuers say specially trained dogs are yet to pick up the scent of survivors, meaning it's very unlikely they'll find anyone else alive. The demolition of buildings, damage beyond repair by the quake, could begin as soon as Tuesday. But this is angering much of the population, who believe the government has been too quick in wrapping up rescue efforts. This resident says many families are yet to receive their relatives' bodies, upsetting those who want a grave site where they can lay flowers. Others say the rushed cleanup is unjust, and that there are still survivors out there waiting to be rescued. There are currently more than 40 people still missing. Ethan Gould, QT News. Hundreds of people have been forced to evacuate their homes as a fast-moving fire rages in Southern California. The blaze began near the city of Corona and has burnt more than 2,000 acres of land. At least one property has been destroyed. Helicopters and other aircraft are dumping water from the air. 500 firefighters are battling the wildfire. After years of campaigning, women in Saudi Arabia may soon be able to drive legally. King Salman has ordered the reform in a decree saying licenses should be issued to women who want them. It's a step closer to equality. For more than 25 years, women activists have campaigned to be allowed to drive. In this campaign video, this woman says she is driving her sisters to work and they would have been late if they had to wait for a male driver to take them. Their protests, which once brought them arrests and harassment, have finally brought change. King Solomon has ordered women be allowed to get behind the wheel, a progressive move for the kingdom. Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world which bans women from driving, an enforcement which has drawn the kingdom great criticism. The United States welcomes the change. We're certainly happy to hear that. If uh, Saudi women are now able to drive, certainly here in the United States, um, we would certainly welcome that. And um, so I think it's, it's a great step in the right direction for that country. The royal decree requires a ministerial body to make a decision on the matter within 30 days. If approved, the ban will be lifted by June 24th next year. Jessica Riga, QUT News. Paris Fashion Week has begun with a stunning strut under the stars. Guests gathered in front of the Eiffel Tower as designers presented ready-to-wear spring and summer collection. The Eiffel Tower exploded in lights as Saint Laurent marked the start of Paris Fashion Week. Models took to the runway in black and white poof dresses. Others shimmered under the sparkling lights, wearing disco-style sequin jumpsuits, high-waisted leather shorts, and heels embellished with feathers. The show is Saint Laurent's first since co-founder Pierre Berge died earlier this month. French actress Beatrice Dale says he'll be remembered for his actions against AIDS, as well as his work with Saint Laurent. Elsewhere, Dior unveiled its collection. Colourful leather and relaxed denim took centre stage. The label has taken a more feminist slant under their first female creative director, Maria Grazia K. Yuri, who's taken inspiration from famous sculptor Nikki Di San Fall. And I think that you 
there are many women that sometimes believe that it's very difficult to make what they really like. Uh, but, and so I think to give this example, like uh, Nikita Sanfal, is positive. She says she wants to help women find a more playful fashion. Joanna Little, QUT News. In sport, Australia has collected more medals at the Invictus Games in Toronto, with Prince Harry watching on. And excitement is building before the weekend's footy grand finals. Cycling and golf have caught Prince Harry's eye on day four of the Invictus Games. Australian Pete Rutland won a gold medal in a bike time trial. He's overcome severe brain injuries suffered in 2010 during a Black Hawk helicopter crash in Afghanistan. Fellow Aussie Tyrone Gawthorne took silver in the men's mid-weight powerlifting. Back in Australia, and over 10,000 Adelaide Crows fans have watched their team train in preparation for Saturday's AFL Grand Final showdown with Richmond. Some fans even skipped work or school to catch a glimpse of their heroes. They are just as passionate in rugby league country and an enthusiastic crowd has swamped the Cowboys in Townsville before this weekend's NRL Grand Final. Oh, the atmosphere is amazing, absolutely amazing. The Townsville people always come out and support the boys. All the attention was on Cameron Smith at the Storms training. He's favourite to win the Dally M Player of the Year award. Both teams will arrive in Sydney in time for tonight's presentation. Josh Martin, QUT News. And now another of our special reports on the 2018 Commonwealth Games. The government has argued they'll inspire a generation of young athletes, but others say more needs to be done at a grassroots level to achieve that. Elite sport is booming in southeast Queensland with $320 million invested for the 2018 Commonwealth Games alone. This significant public spending is partly justified by the state government because of an expected positive impact on grassroots sport. One of the key objectives of the Commonwealth Games for a long-term legacy is to have more Queenslanders participating in sports. Um, for example, I'm a patron of a little athletics club and they always say that after any Commonwealth Games or Olympic Games, you actually see a boost in people joining Commonwealth Games sports. But achieving this may be more complicated than just having Queenslanders watch the Games. Tuning into the Games is practically a national sport in and of itself. But does watching elite athletes in action really get people from the couch to the sporting field? Locals had mixed opinions. Watching uh, sporting events like the Commonwealth Games really inspires me to get out and get active more. I am a fan of um, the Games but I, I, it doesn't really inspire me. Maybe I might be motivated for a little bit, but after the games are finished, I'd probably be back to my normal lifestyle. Research suggests local sporting clubs will need to put in extra effort to turn this interest into participation. So we need to be careful in, in what we are, um, how we're judging events and what we're expecting from them. Um, there is an opportunity there where um, lots of local clubs will see increased interest and if those clubs are prepared for that increased interest then they're more likely to see um, more people participating in their sport. But a lack of resources may stand in their way. We also need to understand that legacy doesn't happen automatically and legacy is not free. So if we want to have sustained sporting um, participation off the back of an event, or, or sorry, in the lead up to and off the back of an event, we do need to make sure that there's adequate resources there to support development of experiences, training of volunteers and coaches and promotion of sport as well. Politicians, however, remain steadfast about the impact on local sport. Every grassroots sport organisation I've spoken to has welcomed having world-class infrastructure here in the South East Queensland for the first time. I mean, the $60 million um, velodrome here in Brisbane, they wouldn't have a brand new velodrome in Brisbane if it wasn't for the Commonwealth Games. But London Olympics showed investment in sports participation is far from guaranteed and numbers dropped following the 2012 event, despite its goal to inspire a generation. The 2018 Commonwealth Games organisers will hope they can buck the trend. Jenny Archdall, QUT News. The weather details are next with Joe Byrne. And the flight to reach the sun.
Hello, time to take a look at the weather. It was cloudy across the southeast today, all the way from the Gold Coast to Sunshine Coast. Let's check those temperatures. It was 26 today in Brisbane, the Gold Coast had a top of 24, 26 on the sunny coast, and slightly warmer in Ipswich at 27. Around the nation tomorrow and today's dreary weather is set to continue. Starting in Sydney, it'll be cloudy, it'll be a cloudy one with 27 the top. Melbourne and Canberra will have cooler weather and morning showers. Rain in Hobart and Adelaide and Perth will experience rain with a likely afternoon storm. The forecast for Queensland tomorrow and there will be clouds over both Cairns and Townsville. Moving inland it will be fine but hot for both Mount Isa and Longreach. Hot weather also for Rocky at 35 degrees and fine weather in Bundaberg. On Moreton Bay winds will be blowing northwest at 25 knots with afternoon in the afternoon, the sea is reaching three metres and the sun will rise at, 20, at 5.30 and set just after 5.40. It's going to be a windy 30 degree day in Gold Coast tomorrow and sunny coast can expect a warm top of 35. The outlook for Brisbane over the next three days, a 36 degree scorcher tomorrow, so find a spot near the aircon. Friday will be warm too, a high of, 30, of 33 and Saturday will be hot with some clouds rolling in. That's the weather for now. Back to you, Noor. Thanks, Joe. And just before we go, much of our weather is, of course, determined by the sun. Now NASA wants to know more about it and is building a space probe to touch it. It's the revolutionary $1.5 billion project set to answer mysteries which have baffled scientists for decades. The Parker Solar Probe is going to be the first spacecraft to ever journey deep into the sun's atmosphere. At the size of a small car, the spacecraft is designed to face temperatures as high as 1,371 degrees Celsius as it circles the sun. Data will be sent back to Earth from as far as 140 million kilometres, helping scientists to understand why the sun's atmosphere is hotter than its surface. The spacecraft will circle Venus seven times to get itself into orbit around the sun by December 2024. Then it will orbit the Sun 24 times, getting closer on each cycle. NASA scientists say there's still a lot to be done before launching next year. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and go, is this really going to do what I think it's going to do? And then we start thinking about another set of tests that we can do just to make sure. Despite the launch date being just under a year away, scientists are already feeling a sense of nostalgia. It's kind of like sending your kid off to college, um, but I know she's going to write and she's going to send lots of data, so it's going to be extremely, extremely exciting. Emma Crichton, QUT News. That brings you up to date with QUT News. Goodbye for now. Goodbye.